I'm preaching a sermon today called Ordering Your Life, The Balance That Brings Success. As Americans, we focus on some things pretty heavily that don't necessarily help us if we get out of balance with them. Today, I want to talk to you about that balance. Anybody notice this pole back here? Who saw this sitting back here? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. You're very aware. Well, this is part of an illustration today, and I need a volunteer. So, Pastor Alex, thank you for volunteering. Would you come up and stand with me here? He's, he, I don't know if you know it, but Pastor Alex was a major athlete in his day. Division I baseball player for Pepperdine Scholarship. Dude had it. Do you still have it, Alex? No, you don't have it anymore? Well, you were good in the day. You were good in the day. He's teaching his grandchildren, you know, at one and two to switch hit. They're hitting from both sides. They're going to they're gonna be good too. Here's what I want you to do. You're an athlete, Alex. I want you to take this, and I want you to put it on your, on your hand, and I want you to just balance it. Do whatever it takes to balance that thing, all right? Let go, yeah. Okay. Pretty good. You got it together. Okay, stop, stop. Now, keep holding on to it. This time, I want you to do it again. We're talking about balance now, but put it in your palm again there. This time, I don't want you to look up. You can't look up. You have to look down at your hand right here at this little black thing. And, and don't look up. Now balance it. Okay, do it again. Keep looking down. Yeah, yeah. See, he did pretty good, but you can't really balance it looking here because that's not the place you need to focus to balance it. You have to look there to get the right focus. Thank you. Let's give this great athlete a hand here. <clears throat> So we're going to talk about that today. Did you know that if you aren't focusing on the things that God speaks to you about to have success, if you're not looking where you need to look and you're looking at other places, it's not going to work out for you. It says in the Bible, in Psalm 37, 5, depend on the Lord, trust him, and he will take care of you. In America, we like to tell God what we want him to do instead of asking him what to do. We like to tell him what we want to be blessed, but we don't ask him what he would have us to do that we might be blessed. And I'm going to bring some things to you that are biblical principles when if you will focus where he says to focus, you'll have more success in life. You'll have more peace. You'll have more joy. You'll have more fruitfulness and fulfillment. Now, let me just add a little caveat. You can't get rid of all the pain when you do everything right. You can't get rid of all the trials because there are people who do things right and have major trials that's, that are not their fault. But we can help ourselves and we can keep a lot of trouble away by focusing on the things that God told us to focus as far as it depends on us, right? We have to depend on other people sometimes. to, if we, For instance, if we want peace in a relationship, it takes two even though your heart's not open or is open. Anyway, do you trust him enough? Here are some things that he talks about. This is the way you got to start if you're going to have a balanced life and blessing and joy. Number one, spend time with Jesus. I know that this is an obvious one, but I also know that as much as we talk about it, all of us struggle at some point to actually do it. Five frogs are sitting on a log, four decide to jump, how many are left? Five, because deciding to jump and jumping are actually two different things. So I'm just saying we're not jumping. You know, we know, but, we're, but, but for some reason we're not jumping. Here's what Jesus says in John 15, 5. I'm the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, we're going to talk about that word, and in him... And I in him, rather, bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. That word abide, the definition of that word in the Greek is to stay in a state of relationship with expectancy. So abiding in Jesus is staying in relationship with him. That requires time. I believe it, it's talking about all day long being with him, but I also believe that it means to get away with him. Jesus is our example. And when he did ministry and walked around and did miracles and talked with people and helped them through things, showing us how to minister, at the end of the day, often he'd pull off up into the hills and talk to his father all alone. And he would spend time. That word also means, abide means to be present, to tarry with. And that word tarry is an old spiritual word. It means to, to hang out to be with for some time, some measured time. 
And if we spend time with Jesus, we'll know his heart for us and we'll know the direction that he would have us to go in the immediacy of our trial, our moment, our decision making. I know my wife Karen pretty well. I know what she's like. I know her mannerisms. I know her looks. She can look a certain way, and I know what that means. But I want to know her heart, so I, li- I try to listen and ask her questions. But I wrote down some things about Karen that I'm going to read to you that I know about her. She, she likes everyone. It's just the kind of person she is. She especially loves older people, though. Just want you to know that, okay? She gives everyone the benefit of the doubt. She's a great listener. She doesn't like politics or debates. I like both those. I, I, I could make a hobby out of those two things. But she loves to work and be productive. She has a place for everything, and she wants everything in its place. She likes coffee in the morning. She likes coffee in the afternoon. She likes coffee in the evening. I'm just saying, okay? She likes to travel. She likes to hike and camp, but she doesn't like to swim. She likes cool restaurants and quaint coffee shops. She likes to read. She's frugal, but she loves to go to Disneyland, and that makes no sense to me whatsoever. I don't know how that can, how can you put those two things together? She likes organization and a good plan. She likes to make things better from behind the scenes. She has great wisdom. She's super intelligent. She's super kind. She knows what she wants. She knows what she likes, and she has no problems letting you know what direction she feels is best. She's a great mom and a great wife. You know, I could say a lot more about Karen, but here's the deal. You know why I know her so well? Because I've been married to her for 40 years. But not only that, we spend a lot of time together. My, my, one of my favorite things in life, people say, what's your, what's your hobby? My hobby's Karen. Whatever Karen wants to do when we have spare time. That's what I want to do, because I like seeing her happy. And she, she makes me happy. I like to be with her. As a result of being with her, I know her very well. So now, let's translate that to Jesus. If, it, Jesus. if it's true that being with someone helps you to know them very well, well, that would translate to our relationship with Jesus. How can we know what he wants? How can we know who he is if we're not with him? Spending time with him. You can't hear him if you don't spend time with him. I hear people say periodically, I don't don't really hear from God. Well, I really believe that if you spend time with him, if you go out of your way and you have a measured time to tarry, that's that old word, to hang out with him, that you will eventually sense that he's speaking to you. So I think there's a direct correlation between not hearing from him and not spending time with him. He wants to spend time with you. Will you spend time with him? So there's two ways that I want to mention that you can spend time with him. And I know they're obvious, and yet they're the disciplines that if we don't get it, if we don't spend the time, it it says in the book of of, uh, 1 Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. These are disciplines But there's a payoff for them. Bible reading, regularly. I like to say daily, but if you can get in the Word for five times a week, I'm good with that. You know, God wants to speak to you. So much of what He wants to say is already in the Bible. One of the things that's happening today that's kind of alarming is we're, we're not as much biblical Christians in America anymore. We're cultural Christians. And because Christians, followers of Jesus, aren't reading the Bible, they don't know what the book says. They don't know what morality is. God's already predetermined these things. You don't want America and a vote of the highest percentage to tell you what morality is. You don't want someone who says that love is being with a five-year-old sexually eventually telling you that that is moral. Where do you go with morality if people can just make it up in their head wherever they want to go. You can't do that. You can't do that. God created us. He gave us an owner's manual, and that owner's manual is the Bible. It tells us the truth that will set us free. But what's happened in America is we're looking at social media. The cultural Christians that aren't reading the Bible, the cultural followers are the ones who see only what the news says, only what 
Facebook or Instagram or TikTok say. And what's going on there is they're not letting the truth of God even come through on those mediums. So what's happening is we're becoming cultural Christians. They tell us what love is and we say, okay. The problem is they don't have the right definition of love. And we're going down the wrong road. But if we're in the word, we're, we know the path of safety. You say, well, uh, God is not mad if I believe something wrong. No, but if you believe something wrong, you cross a line where you get hurt and it hurts others. And God's showing you where safety is. He loves you. But not only that, when you get in the word, I know that those of you who are there, you, you sense the Holy Spirit speak to you. And you should write down those thoughts. You say, well, how do I know they're God for sure? Well, listen, when you're having a thought around the scripture and it's so beautiful when the scripture illuminates something that's not exactly written in that way there, but God starts to speak to you, write it down, review it later. You say, I'm not sure it's God. Just review it later. He will give you direction as you read the word. The Holy Spirit attends the word of God and will take it personally to your heart and mind to make a difference for you. It's uniquely applicable to every individual each time we sit down to, write, to, to read it. And as we write it down, God speaks to us. Here's what it says in Ezra 7. It's an obscure passage in a way, but I like the way it was spoken, and I've used many passages on this before, so I thought this would be a good one. Talking about Ezra the priest, and it said, The good hand of his God was on him, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it. Wow, see, that would be great if believers weren't just looking at the word of God, but they had set in their hearts to do what it said, because that's where blessing is, right? And to teach his statutes and his rules in Israel. You say, well, no one can be perfect. And that seems to be, you know, our, our battle cry for a mediocrity in Christianity today. No one's perfect. Okay, but can you get better? Can you get better tomorrow and next week and next year? And can you grow? Can you improve? The, the answer is yes, you can, and I can too. And as we follow God, we find that more things come together for us, and we find that we're not going a wrong way to bring pain to ourselves or pain to others. We can keep a lot of pain out of our lives by just saying, Lord, what does your word say? I want to do it. Another way to know God's heart, Jesus broke away to pray is prayer, to go before the Lord, to seek him, to know him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Some time away. Some time to sit and talk with him. I would, if you're having trouble praying that way, first thing I would say is just get away don't have the television on. Uh, just find a spot where it's just you and him, you and Jesus. And then I would say it's good to take a list in. You can pray for your family. You can, you can pray for your friends. You can pray for those who are in the hospital right now. Just write some things down before you go and just go through them. Before you know it, you'll pray 15, 20 minutes. But then I would just spend some time saying, God, what is it that you'd speak to me? And just be still and quiet. I believe he's a God that speaks. I believe he's a God that will lead and guide as his Holy Spirit moves. He wants to be with you, but you need to have this desire to be with him or it won't happen. Enough of that. I'll just say this. Intimacy with Jesus is the height of success. I'm going to share four things here, but this is the key component. The key component, because in these other things, if you follow Jesus, he'll help you with each one of them with the direction, with the emphasis with the application. He leads you and he guides you. And as you get close to him, you'll be in sync more with what will bless your life. Second thought today, work hard. Now I said that, and I've got four things today, but let me just say this. If you do any one of these things without the balance of the rest of these things, it's not going to work. And that includes number one, time with Jesus. We had monks in centuries old that made a, a vow to get in a cave and be with God and they never came out and their whole existence till they died was to just talk to God. Well, there's a problem with that because the Bible says that we need to bear fruit. We read that earlier. The Bible says that we need to reach out and to love and to have an impact. 
And, and if, if you don't work, the Bible says faith without works is dead. And if, we'll get to these others, if you, if you don't find balance in these things, any one of them can throw you off. Although number one's the key, it's if you do just that, 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 that won't work either because you'll forget your family. You'll forget other priorities and God would lead you to watch over those priorities, okay? Secondly, work hard. Colossians 3.23, all the work you're doing, I'm sorry, in all the work you're doing, work the best you can. Well, let's just stop there for a moment. I don't really like to hear be the best because you may not be able to. I do like to hear be the best you can be. Do your best. Like, that's a better way to go, right? And if you're doing your best around your gifting, wherever you're working, you will excel. But here's a question for us. At work, are we doing our best? Are we giving our best effort there at work? Well, we might if we took this second part of the verse, work as if you were doing it for the Lord, not for people. You know what that means? That means every one of us are ministers, and your place of ministry is where you work. Do it as unto the Lord, not for people. There's a dangerous thing that's happened in our culture during the pandemic. And I just feel like I want to speak to it. We've had two years where people are making more money on unemployment than they could in working. So as a result, rather than work, they just stayed with the unemployment. And that has created a problem in our culture. We can't get people to come back to work. They... I'm just going to say it from my perspective, got lazy. They're learning for other people to take care of them. They want the government to do it for them. They get this sense of entitlement. And I'll tell you, one of the things that a generation is struggling with today, and especially a younger generation, is they're focused too much on pleasure, as weird as that may sound. God's not against pleasure. But if all you do is look for that moment where you can get that adrenaline rush, whether it's bowling or video games, whatever it may be, old or young, whatever you do. The, the point is, in balance, there's nothing wrong with that, recreation. But if you're just looking for pleasure, the problem is you'll never have a sense of fulfillment in your life. You'll always, you'll always be unhappy at some level because you, you got to take it to the next adrenaline moment. And this is a dangerous thing that's happened in our culture where we're not working. I mean, they're trying to pay. I saw something on the coast where they were giving a $2,000 bonus if people would drive a bus. What that means is they can't get workers. I'm sure you got to work for six months to get it, but we've never seen that in our culture before. We have to coerce people back into the working environment, and um, our nation is struggling, and this is not all of it, but this is a piece of it right here. Workers won't work. You, you know when you go down to Wendy's and it's not open? It's not about the pandemic. It's about people won't come back to work. They can't get workers. And so, so we're, we're just in a weird time. It reminds me of something that happened with one of Karen's friends when she was young. She was a teenager, and her dad was talking to her about responsibility and working. And here's what she said to him. I didn't ask to be brought into this world. You gave birth to me, and you wanted this to happen. You will take care of me. Okay. Well, we got a little bit of a problem there, don't we? That's not going to help her to be successful in life. As it turns out, she turned out great and she listened and she, she was and is a great worker in the long haul. But we've got a little bit of that going on right now where people, people feel like, no, you take care of me. I, you, but God, God created you to work. That's part of what you're supposed to do. Do work and don't be lazy. I love the word in the Bible, sluggard. I think it's such a cool word. It's not in every version. Someone told me earlier that in Proverbs 26, 14, in their version of the Bible, it's slacker, slacker. But listen to what it says here in the Bible. As the door turns on its hinges, so the sluggard turns on his bed. Could be her bed as well. So the deal is, they're so lazy, they want everyone else to take care of them, they, they, they're not going to get up and do work. They're just going to live off everyone else. As the door turns on its hinges, it's a sluggard on their bed. Have you ever been to a restaurant, a fast food place, where they just are moving so slow, it's just painful? 
part of the root word of sluggard is sloth or slothful, like the animal. And so let me just give you a little bit about what that may look like. The sluggard who's not working hard in that public place, they're behind the counter now and you give your order and they're like, I'll get it in just a moment. Excuse me. It's like, oh my gosh, move, you know? You're driving me crazy. What are you doing? It's more fun to go and work and be and, and well, it's, this isn't going to work for you and it's not working for anybody else. Now, if that sounds ridiculous, remember this. God has designed each one of you to work and be productive. You will not feel fulfilled if you don't work and you're not productive. You won't have a sense of fulfillment in life. That's part of what's going on with, with the generation that, that is having trouble. Proverbs 14, 23. This is in the Bible. I didn't make up the hard work thing. This is what the Bible says. Hard work always pays off. These are God's words, not mine. It pays off. Mere talk puts no bread on the table. I read this somewhere this week, but I liked it. God gives the birds their food, but he doesn't throw it into their nests. When we work hard and honestly, here's what happens. First of all, God is honored. Man, we're the best workers in the workplace. We don't have attitudes. We have good attitudes. We, we, we treat everybody well, and we work hard. We, we want the company to make money. I don't even think people think about that these days. That's why they hire you, to help the company make money. And they're paying you. They can pay you better if they have more productivity, right? Okay, I, I, I'm not a corporate leader. I'm just, I'm just saying, if you, if you hired for a certain wage and you're going to work, give it your best. doesn't matter what the wage is. You said yes. Get out there and give it your best. So God is honored. Secondly, we're rewarded financially because you get ahead in life. And then third, you are a good provider for your family the way God asked you to be. But this last one, I don't think people think about it. You feel better. We feel better about ourselves because we're productive. That's the way we're wired. You can watch it with a teenager once they get this whole thing about work and productivity. Men, they feel more fulfilled in life and they move forward and they have success. And God is into that. He's not against it. Psalm 128, 2 says, you enjoy what you work for. If you look at the other side of that, it means you might not appreciate what you don't work for that somebody's giving you. You don't appreciate them for giving it to you, which is why we shouldn't give it to them too long. You enjoy what you work for, and you'll be blessed with good things. That's productivity. Okay. So now, again, any one of these things out of order, if you do that and you're all about work, you go, I got that one. Nope, you can't just have the one. You got to get them all, okay, to have balance and to do well. You can overwork and ruin this next one, family. Spend time with your family. We're talking about balance. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to talk about my wife and my children, but I realize there's some single people here. So I want to try to translate for you before we start. The word for family, the root word is familiar. You see it with Hispanics when they say familial. That means family, okay, familiar. So you may not have a spouse. You may not have children, but I want to tell you how important your roots are. You need to go back to your family and be with them on a regular basis. You say, well, my, my mom and dad, I don't get along with them. Okay, well, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. I hope they are, but if they're not, it's on you to go there and love them and let, show them what it looks like. You say, they didn't do it right. Well, just be there to love them as far as it depends on you. Be at peace with everyone. But Donna Barrett was here as a single woman who was about 60 years old, speaking about a year ago. I hope you caught what she said. She's never been married. I don't think, I think God's called her to be single. The Bible speaks of that. Never been married, never had children, but she spoke about spending time with her family as part of her sermon. And she spoke about how she spends time with her nieces and nephews. She schedules time with them. She schedules even retreats with them. She is pouring into their lives. I'm just saying you still have family and, and put some time into family, okay? That, that's for the singles there if this doesn't work for you. But, but let's, let's go with this now, spouse. Spend time with your spouse. Song of Solomon says this, you have captivated my heart 
my sister. And that's talking about sister in the Lord. My bride, you have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. Time with your spouse will energize you. I heard a counselor say, a Christian counselor, and at the time I didn't believe it. I wasn't sure about it. Maybe that's the way to say it. He said from the pulpit, speaking right here at this church many years ago, the leader of Emerge Ministry, the president of an organization that counsels thousands of ministers, he said, there's only two energy-producing relationships in life, and one is God and the other is your spouse. And I heard that and I thought, no, no, my kids are energy-producing. It only took me about a week thinking about that and hanging out with the kids to realize as much as I love them, they're not producing energy for me. Moms, can I get an amen on that? There's, there's not, there's not, there's not, it's draining to be with them at times. But I have found what he said about a spouse to be true. Energy producing God and spouse. That when I'm with God, it puts wind in my sails. When I get time away with Karen or time to sit together and be together, it puts wind in my sails and it does the same for her. Time with your spouse will energize you. So you got to get it. You got to protect it. You say, I'm so busy, which means you're great at scheduling things. Put it on your calendar. Tell people, I have an appointment. There's nothing wrong with that because that's your most important appointment, okay? And make time. Don't just take it. Make it because this can get away from you. And there, there's consequences for not staying close to one another. One of the things we do at our house is coffee time. And from, our, from the time when our kids were very small, we would have an afternoon, sometimes early, sometimes late, depending on what, what the day did. But we'd have coffee together, Karen and I. And we told the kids, you can't talk to us. They're little, right? Nope, you can't talk to mom and dad right now. We're having, we're having time together. And it's only 10 or 12, 15 minutes. Then we're done and we're off and we're running. To this day, our kids won't talk to us if we're having coffee together. If they do, they might say, can I say something? You know, because they know that we prioritize connecting. I feel like if I don't connect with her, now I can't get it every day, but I try to. If I don't connect with her every day, I might know or not know her heart for what's going on right now. I might not know what she's going through. You got to connect. You say, well, I know my spouse really well. We got it down. I know who they are. Well, you don't know who they are in this season because there's things changing all the time. Right? It's not the same when your kids are two and four as it is when they're 16 and 18. All right? And you got to connect with your spouse around what's going on now in their hearts and how can we handle this. For instance, if you're just letting time fly by, you may not know, you may not be watching, or you may not address that that young teenage boy is popping off to his mom and he's being a smart aleck. He's not appreciating who she is. He's not appreciating how to love her. And you may not even know her heart's wounded because you're not connected. But if you're connected and you can hear her heart and feel her heart, then you can have a talk with that boy. I'm just making this up. I'm not saying there's a boy in here like this right now, okay? But... But the point is things change and shift and you just have to stay close because you're her spiritual covering. You're his best partner, a co-heir in Jesus who loves him and knows him best and can give counsel in times of difficulty. And, and often when, when I'm down, Karen's up. And when I'm up, Karen's down. And we need each other, man, to figure it out, right? You've been there. We got to be together. You got to know your spouse's heart and bless them. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9 says it this way. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days for this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. It's a gift. Lean into it. Don't let it go by. How about children? Spending time with your children. I remember years ago when I was a district youth director, we had 34 events a year. You're talking about an event here, Rush, that we, we, we had 34 events, 20 youth camps, and then we had other events like youth convention. There'd be hundreds and thousands coming to the events. There's promo for all those events. I was 26 to, to 33 in this season. And then I was traveling regionally to speak at other youth conventions in, in states, mostly in the Northwest. <clears throat> we were busy. We were young. I didn't know how to slow it down at the time. But I realize if I don't, <clears throat> I'm going to pay some consequences in some places, right? 
As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I came here is I wasn't going to give up time for my family there. That's what I decided, that I couldn't, I couldn't do that any longer. I had to be present. My kids were going into school. They'd been with me the whole time. Now they're going to school. i got to be present. So you can thank, if, if you think Pastor Stan's tenure has been good, you can thank those kids that I had a heart for to stay close to as part of that reason I came. But when we were busy in this season and I'd made a decision trying to figure it out as a young man that I would pull out of some of the winter camps, I think we had seven of them, every weekend, seven weekends in a row, where I would go in Friday night, we'd come out Sunday afternoon, we'd drive down from the mountain and I'd work during the week. Then I'd go up on the mountain, you know, Jay, the whole, the whole thing. And it can be fun, but it can be, it'll, it'll get wearisome. So I made this decision to try to set it up for the next guy too that I would leave on Saturday night halfway through this retreat that we had good leaders and would let them do it. So we did it the first week. We set it up, had good leaders in place, left, came down the hill, and I'm looking at Saturday night at 7 o'clock. I'm looking at my watch and thinking, oh, man, they're starting service. I'm feeling guilt. I should be there. Oh, you know, here I am just having fun and relaxing. And I, you know, that's, what, that's just the way I was feeling. While I was feeling that, my... Two-year-old Aaron is just crawling all around and laughing, and we're doing this, I don't know what it was, uh, uh, some little game there, blocks, and he's having fun, and he's talking to me, kind of, mostly English, and, and, uh, and I'm looking at him, and I'm feeling this guilt, and I hear the Lord say this, this is better than that. That's what God spoke to me. This is better than that. That being here with your boy and making sure you're connected is better than being connected to those boys and leaving him behind, than those people and leaving him behind. When Candace was little, one of the, another thing we did, you say, man, did you really have, we, we had, um, th- now, now we had to struggle to do this and there were times it was off and then it was on again, but mostly we had a date night every week in, the, in their growing up years of our children. And you say, how can you have a day I don't have any money? You don't have to have money, go for a walk, go Go to the mall. Just do, do something together. S- sit at a coffee shop. Don't buy coffee. You know, the table's outside. Just, just be together. And I remember when we'd go, Candace especially as a two or three-year-old, she'd latch onto her mom's leg, and Karen's like dragging her, you know, as we're going towards the door. And, and she's just crying like this is the end of the world, you know. And we're like, I'm like, hey, mom loves you. I love you. We'll be back. We always come back. But this is what I would say to her. I'd look her in the eyes and I'd say, Mommy and Daddy really love each other. And we need to be together. So we're going to be together, but we'll be back. Did you know when you love your spouse, you're giving the best gift you could ever give to your kids? You're showing them the way. It's like they're not the most important thing. Jesus is. And you can't make them think everything revolves around them or it will when they're 20. And so we're, 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 we're teaching them along the way what relationship looks like and the balance of these things. But I remember we'd, we'd also have a movie night or family night is what we called it in those days. And so like every Friday night, we'd watch a movie. And you know, it's some kind of silly movie, Disney cartoon, Father of the Bride, you know, those old things. There's always cool songs in there at the end. And at the end of every movie, when that fast music would start, I would sweep up Candace and I would just dance all over the room with her. Man, we'd just jump and I'd throw her up and she would giggle. And then it got to where when the music would start, I would stand back and I wouldn't go right away. And I'd look at her and she'd go, dance me, daddy. And so I'd grab her and I'd throw her all around and we would spin. But you know what? Those were our moments, man. We were having fun. You want to have fun with your kids too because it'll help in those moments where there's something hard that has to be spoken. That's difficult. Spending time with, and I, those times are so valuable. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 6, 7. This is directly related to time now. Repeat them. It's talking about the truths of God. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them and look what's happening. When you're at home, so you're at home with your kids. When you're on the road, so you're on the road with your kids. When you're going to bed, so you're putting your kids to bed. And when you're getting up, so you're there when they get up. 
Now, I know you can't do that all day, all the time, but you can be regular and consistent. And there's something about that love that helps the truths of God be received. As a matter of fact, they won't receive the truths of God near as well if you don't have a relationship with them. Do your best to be close to them. It's part of what they have to decide too. I'll just throw this out. I didn't say it in the last service, and I know it's harder for others. I can make my own schedule, but I'm probably as busy as any of you. I'm just saying. You don't know that, but I probably am. I, I had, and one day this week, I had seven straight hours of meetings where I didn't leave. You know, we're just going through the meetings, and I'm leading these meetings. Man, that'll fry your brain. Uh, it's, it, but, but, so I'm, I'm busy, but during their, their years of growing up, I took... Aaron and Candace to lunch every week for those 12 years. Now, there was a year where Candace was so cool, she didn't want me driving up to the high school year, right? So we didn't do it that year because I, I didn't want to force anything on her, right? But her junior year, she's back on. Yeah, let's do lunch again. So we did it. Aaron, you know, when he was growing up, I don't know about your junior higher, but, you know, like, how'd your day go? Good. How'd you done that test? Fine. I mean, I can't get him to say more than one word, you know, unless I take him to lunch. You get food in front of that boy, and all of a sudden he talks. So, so uh, you know, that's, that's the key to the junior high board right there. Get food in front of them, and, the, and they talk. At least for, for our boy it was. But I tried to stay close to them. I wanted them to know that they mattered. Listen, you can tell your kids you love them, and if you don't spend time with them, they'll never believe you. They'll never fully believe it because they spell love T-I-M-E. Just throw that out there. Okay, lastly, plan time to rest. That's right. You can work hard. You can spend time with your family. You can spend time with God. You can find the balance of all these things. And part of what God says is work hard, but I want you to rest. Here's what it says in the Bible. In Exodus 20, it says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. God has created you to rest, and he's so into it that he showed you the way. Six days you shall labor and, on the, and do all your work, but on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath to the Lord, and on that day, you will not do any work. For in six days, listen to it, the God's example now, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. So I hear some people say, well, I don't need to sleep as much as others. Okay. Um, I, I would just like to get a survey in your family about that. Like, honestly, we're all toddlers all through life when it comes to food and sleep. If you don't get it, you are cranky. I'm just telling you. Okay? So there's something about the balance of this that we have to watch. But rest. You say, I don't need it as much as others. Well, man, God needed it and you don't? That's interesting. God took a Sabbath, but you don't need You're better than God. Congratulations. He's showing us the way. Here's the thing. If we rest, we will feel better. We'll stay closer to God, family, and friends, and, and the things that matter most. Rest will help. Okay, so I'm going to give you something that's a secular book right now. This is, this is not God's word. I don't know who this lady is, but I like what she said, so I'm bringing it to you. In her book, Burnout, Emily Nagasaki, that's the author of the book is Burnout, asserts that our bodies need to be resting, and she says, inclusive of sleep and replenishment, 42% of the time your body needs to be resting. Here's what that means. This is totally secular survey, studies, but all truth is God's truth. If the study reveals it, then we don't have to be afraid of it, right? And, and so if you sleep eight hours a day, well, there's a good portion of that 42. But that would mean that even during the week, you need to find a couple hours a day where you have some rest happening, where you have a little bit of downtime. So you add to that sleep eight hours, and then you add two more. That's 42%. And she says quite bluntly, I like Emily Nagasaki just because of this statement. She, I already admire her. Because she's fun. She said, we're not saying that you should take 42% of your time to rest. We're saying if you don't take the 42%, the 42% will take you. It will grab you by the face, shove you to the ground, put its foot on your chest, and declare itself the victory. 
or the victor. Thank you, Emily, for helping us understand this. A little more blunt there. But we need rest. And studies will reveal. Eventually, if we get accurate studies, it'll reveal the truth of what God's word has said all along the way. And then I would say this about rest. Get away every now and then. Take a vacation. Did you know when you go away, you have a little relaxation, you'll come back, and you're in your work, you'll have better judgment than you had before? I don't know about you, but I can feel the anxiety building in me. And I, I'll tell Karen sometimes, I'm not doing very well. And I don't mean I'm falling away from Jesus. I'm just, I just feel the frustration mounting, and I'm not at, I, I'm, I'm feeling like, okay, I have to be really careful right now. And it's almost always around not getting rest for a season, not having the balance. You have to fight it, right? You have to make sure that you value it enough that to the point where you're actually doing it. Your judgment will be better. Get some distance away because when the work, when you get away, the work appears smaller. So go away. Put the work to your back for a little bit. Get out of town. You say, I don't have any money. Well, you got a friend in Ben who has a house. Switch houses with them on the weekend. Won't cost a dime. Something like that, Right. But I believe that there's beautiful moments that can be created. Think of it. And I, I'm, not, I'm not big on taking vacation with other people because it's so hard to connect with your own family. I'm not against it, but I'm just saying if that's all you do, you're not going to be connecting with your kids in a significant way. And you have an opportunity when it's nothing, it's unfettered time and fun, you have an opportunity to build memories. This is part of resting that I'm talking about. Years ago, we had a fella who was one of the wealthiest men in Oregon at the time. And he doesn't go to this church, but I was meeting with him talking about maybe giving to our, to our work, to the work of God here at Horizon. And I really liked him. He's just such a man of God. I mean, he was just true blue. All, he belonged all to Jesus. And at the end of our time, he didn't give any money, but he said, uh, I just really enjoyed him. And, and he's become a friend. But he said to me, hey, we got a house in Hawaii we just built. If you ever want to go there, just let me know, and you can schedule it. I go, like, you're not just saying that, because I might call you. He said, call me. Two years later, I sent him a message, and he sent back a couple dates, and we took it. And we went to Hawaii, man. We, there's no way we could have afforded this. We walked into this massive house, brand new, had to be millions of dollars, and we'd never been in anything like that. As a matter of fact, Aaron said in the moment, my son was a teenager at the time. We were in that house for two hours. I mean, there was a big old wall that opened up to the pool right outside. There, there was just big old rooms. We all went to separate places with the room that had like this giant screen TV. And we didn't come back to see each other for a little bit. And, and, but, but when we came out, Aaron said, Dad, I feel like at any moment someone's going to show up and say, I'm sorry, you're not supposed to be here. You need to leave. It was so nice. We were just unfamiliar with it. But I remember cooking steaks that night, barbecuing, on the table right beside the pool as the sun was setting. And I remember hearing my little girl laugh and my son laugh, and they're telling stories. And I'm sitting there and I think, this is one of the coolest moments we've ever had. This is so cool. And I realized that God had given us that moment. That's really a gift from him. And I believe that if you'll prioritize what he says is important, he'll make a way for you to be at places you wouldn't normally be able to be because you value what he says is valuable. You value that time with the family. And if you think that's just an Old Testament principle, listen to this, Hebrews 4, 9. There remains then a Sabbath. This is the New Testament. A Sabbath rest for the people of God. Oh, so it is still for today. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his Let us therefore make every effort to enter the rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. There's a consequence to not getting that rest. So here it is. It's before you now. What is is all this this balance thing? Well, you got to focus in the right place. The The moment you look the wrong place, oh, the moment you say, I got a better way, God says, Remember me first. Be there for your family. 
Work hard, but find the balance of rest. I just think that's really going to bless your life if you'll take it. Bow your heads and we're going to pray. Father, thank you for your truth that sets us free. God, I pray that you'd help people to receive this so that they might be blessed. There is no condemnation in this message today. Lord, you know I've had to wrestle these things and sometimes I get out of balance, but when I wrestle my way back to the truth of what you're saying, the the blessing resides there. So help me, God. Help us. Help us to look forward, not to look back in shame, but to look forward and say, all right, you got a plan, Lord, and I want to follow it. I know you want to bless me. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to encourage you to just ask the Lord if there's an area that he would speak to you about. Maybe it's an area where you're doing too much and not too little. Maybe it's an area that you haven't prioritized as part of that balance. But let him speak to you for just a moment, a moment of silence and prayer. What would you say to me, Lord? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask this question. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Is he the Lord of your life? Because it starts with him. If you get in, he'll lead you in all these areas of truth that he speaks of in his word. He'll help you. He'll guide you. He'll bring healing where things are broken. But most of all, the Bible says he's the only way to salvation, the only way to eternal life. Yeah, he'll enhance your life, but it's way bigger than that. He'll give you eternal life in heaven. He's here to walk with you in this life and give you eternal life. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you this question. Do you know him as your Lord, as your Savior? If not, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand in just a moment. If you lift it, what you're saying is, I want to invite Jesus into my heart and my life. I want to make him the Lord of my life. Not just a great historical person, not just someone I admire, not just someone I give lip service to, but I... I believe in him with all my heart, so I'm going to become a follower of Jesus. I want you to lift your hand on the count of three. No one looking around, just a moment of privacy. If you could say, I'll pray that prayer with you, Pastor. I'll say it out loud. You'll say a line by line. You'll repeat it. But everyone in this room will say it out loud with us to lend strength to your voice. Are you ready to come to Jesus? He loves you so much. He's longing to bless you in this life and to give you eternal life. You lift your hand when I say three. No one looking around. One, two, three. Just lift your hand if you want to receive Christ today. Okay. All right. Okay. God bless you and you. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to pray. People are coming to Jesus. Say these words out loud. If I didn't see your hand, you didn't lift your hand, but you want Jesus. If you pray this sincerely, he'll come into your heart and your life. You haven't made too many mistakes. He loves you. Everyone say this with these coming to Jesus. Say, Father God. Please forgive me. I've gone my own way. I've done my own thing. I haven't sought you. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I believe that you love me. I trust that you gave Jesus to be my Savior, to die for my sins. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Lead me in my life. I'm going to follow you. I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.